Tennessee Oral History Collection designated as MT 2000.062. This is Betty Rowland. Today is Tuesday, October 30th, 2001, and I'm interviewing James Walls at his home located in Smyrna, Tennessee. The tape of this interview, along with the transcription of the interview, will become part of the MTSU Oral History Collection and will be available to the public. Future researchers may include portions of this interview in their publications. Is that all right with you, Mr. Mm -hmm. Walls? Okay. Will you state your full name? James F. Walls. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what's your date of birth? Uh, April 20th, 1919. 1919. Where were you born? Harrison County, Iowa. Oh, my goodness. What was your father's name? Frank. I'm Junior. Okay. And what was your father's occupation? He was a welder for the railroad. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? Oh, yes. Tell me about that. Stories you remember of that. Well, uh, he was a welder for the railroad, and, and they needed a lot of welders when they had the steam engines. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had uh, 20 years or so with the railroad, and the steam engines were died, you know, they, they were taken over by diesel engines. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, they, they laid him off. Oh, know, really? Yeah, in Missouri Valley. Mm -hmm. And he spent the last 10 years that he was in the service that I was in, that he was in the railroad, uh, working in Chicago. Well, they gave him a job, so he commuted to Chicago mm -hmm. and came home on weekends. Now, the welding that he did for the railroad, was that on the tracks or was it on the actual yeah, locomotives? It was on the engines. He would weld uh, the rod, the pump pumping rod, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and all, all the welding and repair of engines. My goodness, mm -hmm. my goodness. What was your mother's name? I, I, Iva Williams. Mm -hmm. What was her occupation? She was a housewife mm -hmm. and a good one. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have brothers and sisters? Oh, yes. I had uh, one brother and uh, three sisters. All present tense. And uh, one, one sister was an army nurse and was in the South Pacific. And uh, I have a brother that uh, that got out and uh, was a, became a pilot, while but uh, didn't get, didn't see any active duty because the war ended, and he went on to uh, school and became a doctor. Mm -hmm. Do you have mem? Uh, what are some of your early childhood memories? <laughs> well, uh, the, the folks, we lived across the tracks, and the trains would uh, pull up and block our way to, to up that uptown. Mm -hmm. And uh, the folks would tell me how to crawl under the trains uh, and not get cut cut up. Oh my goodness! Now the train is sitting still. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> and. Uh, if you listen, you know, the train would back up and bump, 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 bump get, a, get a running start with the train. And uh, you could hear that bump, 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 bump coming, and you could get out of the way. That's a skill I don't have. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Well, yeah. What about your early childhood uh, education, school? Uh, I was, uh, went to high school. Uh, at the Missouri Valley, mm -hmm. I graduated from high school. I was a track athlete, and uh, I got a, a scholarship to Drake University. And I went over there about, about, about didn't finish my first year. Mm -hmm. And uh, joined the Air Force because we knew that the war was coming. Mm -hmm. You felt, you know. What year was that? 1939. 1939. Before we, uh, that's why I'm here, of course, to talk to you about your World War II experiences. But do you have any memories of the Depression? Oh, yes. 
Share those with me. Uh, the, the folks, uh, my dad lost his job with the railroad. Mm -hmm. Was that during the Depression? Yeah, that was. Or yeah. as a result? Yeah, probably. Uh, uh, my, um, I was in sixth grade, probably. Sixth grade? Mm -hmm. Somewhere along there. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of the people that I ask here in this area about depression, they said, well, everyone was poor, but we had our gardens and things. Yeah, but you're we, from further north, so... We, it, we, we, we had a big garden. Mm -hmm. Oh, a monstrous garden. Mm -hmm. yeah. The depression came and uh, Dad was laid off and didn't have a job. And he farmed. Uh, we had a cow, and uh, the cow got tuberculosis, and I had to get rid of the cow. <laughs> uh, but uh, Dad farmed probably uh, two acres. He put in potatoes and uh, harvested potatoes in the winter, and would go out and pick them and get about 30 bushel and put them in the cellar. Well, you had potatoes to eat if you didn't have anything else, didn't you? Lots of potatoes. <laughs> I still like fried potatoes with onions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, hmm. Used to make the money fishing on the Missouri River. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what were we talking about? We were talking about the depression oh. and just Things memories and how it impacted families, businesses, mm. individuals. Oh. Yeah. Your parents stayed together, a lot of people. Yeah, they stayed together. Mm -hmm. Had a, a good, good, wonderful home life. Mm -hmm. Dad and Mom fought, you know, but they, they stayed together. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, Dad, Dad uh, raised uh, potatoes and corn and beans, and I, I picked native beans till I was like, but most kids hated the gardens. You know that would work, to, but uh, they, they uh, raised beans and potatoes, and cabbage, mixed sauerkraut, and mom canned. Four or five hundred quarts of food. My goodness. We had a cave. We kept the thing that had stuff in there. You know? A cave? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like a cellar? Yeah, but it was out by itself. Uh -huh. A cave is hole in the ground with a door, uh -huh. and you go into it. They call it bomb shelter now. Oh. <laughs> it was a bit of good one. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was, a nat it was a natural mm -hmm. place, a natural setting. It wasn't something that you made. Yeah, we yeah. made we made it. Oh, you did. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. Dug we dug a hole in the dug ground. Dug it out, blocked it up, so it was mounded. Mm -hmm. it, it was visible. Oh, okay. Part of it, half part of it, it was visible. Half of the ground. Big deep root cellar. Mm -hmm. Well, now, when did you first really begin to become aware of the events that were going on in? That's it. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, I brought a digital camera. I want to make some pictures. I understand he's got some scrapbooks that I'll get some pictures later. When did you first become aware? You would have been in high school when you were hearing the rumblings of war in Europe. Uh, probably uh, my junior in school, high school. What do you remember? Uh, the, the, there was a junk, Jew, Jewish person in town named Mo Ricks. Mm -hmm. And he bought iron, you know, mm -hmm. pay, pay a few pennies a pound for it, you know. Mm -hmm. And he had a, a, a whole block covered with scrap iron, piled up as high as he could do, do, do it manually. And uh, I thought, my God, God, what will he ever do with that? And the Japanese bought that whole pile of iron and shipped that iron to Japan. Oh, my goodness. And that was my, probably my first recollection that uh, the J Japanese were up to something, you know. Mm -hmm. 
Now, well, what did they want with all desire? <laughs> guess we found out later on, didn't yeah. we? Yeah. Um, now you graduate from high school. Yeah. And you said you went to Drake mm -hmm. College, but you only went there one year. Yeah, less than one year. Did you choose to enter the service? Uh -huh. yeah. You weren't drafted. I cho chose, yeah. So tell me about that decision and what your family thought about it. Well, I, it was a bad decision. <laughs> uh, uh, they, they didn't like it because it was so special because I was going into the service. Mm -hmm. And I went into the service with, uh, with the co-captain of the football team, with me. And uh, we went, uh, went, well, we all went over to Hawaii, and we chose Hawaii, you know, be, before enlisted, mm -hmm. and went over there. So you had a choice of where you were going to be stationed? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Now, you chose Air Force. Mm -hmm. Tell me why you made that choice. Always, always wanted to be a pilot. Mm -hmm. And uh, it wasn't until uh, the... Uh, work came along that uh, the, the Lord did the requirement from two years of college to a high school graduate. Mm -hmm. And I was in uh, over in the Heckham Field when the bomb dropped and I had a list and had immediately had applied for flying training. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, I went. Mm -hmm. Tell me, before you got to uh, Hawaii, tell me about the training that you had. Was your training in at Hickam Field, or uh, was your training, training here oh, in the yeah. States? Well, I had basic training and everything was at the Hickam Field. Yeah. Oh, so when you enlisted, you immediately yeah, right. mm -hmm. went to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Okay, how did you go? You went by boat. <laughs> tell me about that. Well, uh, the first time I, I ever saw anybody sick, you know, seasick. Mm -hmm. And they were hanging over the side, heaving, <laughs> and uh, nothing would come up because they'd already gone so many times. All that come out would be green slime. Mm. <laughs> now the ships that uh, later went to Europe went in convoys. Did you go in convoy? No, no. There was no reason for that kind of concern mm -hmm. no. at that time. Name, name of the boat was Leonard Wood. Leonard Wood. Mm -hmm. Was it a military transport? Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, tell me about arriving in Hawaii. I really, we, we arrived at the dock right below the Aloha Tower. Do you know when that was? Do you remember basically uh. about when that was? Probably January of 1941. Okay. Or 42. 42. Okay. Let's yeah. see. Pearl Harbor. No, it was December 7th. 41 was Pearl Harbor. Yeah, so 19. you must have arrived in January yeah. of 41. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, tell me about your training. Well, uh, what basic training, you know. Mm -hmm. Learn how to drill, how to shoot a 45 caliber, and how not to shoot yourself. <laughs> that would be a good thing to know. <laughs> And uh, that was about it. And then they uh, offered us, what do you want to do in the service? And I said, I want to be a mechanic. And they, they, they said, well, how about being a guard? I said, no, no way I want to be a guard. Guess what I got? I got to be a guard. Oh, really? And they sent me down to, to the police station, MP, and I went to work with a fellow named uh, Kramer and uh, he was a tennis player and uh, I, I uh, kept my, a tennis racket at my bunk and I'd go play every day and he said say Waltz can you play tennis? I said well I've played some but I'm not good so uh, I thought I'd beat him you now and he says, well, you want to play tennis with me? I says, well, you get me off guard duty and I'll play tennis with you. Mm -hmm. and he says, uh, that's the deal. So I went and played tennis with him and he got me off guard duty. Mm -hmm. Now we all know that things changed dramatically 
uh, after Pearl Harbor's attack on December 7th. Mm -hmm. But in that time before the attack, what was it like? Was there tight security? Were you anticipating uh, I During that first few years, uh, right, at, right after I got it, I went as, uh, uh, after December, well, before December 7th, I, I, when I first got over there, I went to a mechanic school, mm -hmm. and it was three months. And uh, at, at, after school, I went to, to work on the line on the airplanes, and uh, the the tension grew. Uh, the night before the attack, I had gone. I, I bought a motorcycle and I went to uh, a theater out in Waikiki, and uh, I, know, I can't remember what was on, but anyway, the, the electricity out there that, in that neighborhood, it was largely Japanese, I just wanted to get out of there. <laughs> it didn't feel safe, mm -hmm. and I felt the Japanese were going to start a war, but I didn't have any idea that they were going to come in like they did. Uh, I didn't think they could do that, you know. We had patrols out, but they, they, they all looked in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. I, I stood, understood later. And, and we, at, uh, we had uh, dispersed the aircraft and things, uh, scattered them around the, the field. And uh, the, the day the day before the attack, they moved them back and put them in line. And I don't know why they did that. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but 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 before that time, we had dispersed the aircraft across the field and so forth. You know? So they wouldn't make such yeah. a easy target. When they tell me the layout of the land, because I'm not familiar with it. Now the ships that we think of at Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. Where is Hickam Field in relationship to that? Uh, well, <coughs> you can see it across the field and the bay there. Uh, it's probably four or five miles mm -hmm. to 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 the, the uh, Aloha Tower, which is which symbolizes Hawaii. You know, it was uh, part of the. Uh, The glamour, I guess, uh, of uh, <coughs> of going to Hawaii to dock uh, to dock below that Aloha Tower, and uh, people throw money overboard, and the divers would go down and get the money. You know? mm -hmm. And I would still like to go down <laughs> with a dredge and get that money out of the mud that they missed. <laughs> you think there's a good bit there? Huh? You think there's a good bit there? I, I would think so because <laughs> they couldn't, they, they, they missed a lot of money. Now you said that prior to the attack the planes had been dispersed, they had been brought back. What about the ships? Were, had the ships been scattered? Were they anticipating anything? Could you tell? Uh, Do you remember? I would imagine they had uh, some s suspicion because they didn't bring the aircraft carriers in with the battleships already in there, mm -hmm. and they wouldn't bring. Didn't but they had them outside the harbor there? Uh, uh, I say outside, maybe two, three hundred miles. Mm -hmm. What did it look like, the ships in the harbor, to you? Were they just lined up, just? One right beside the other. Were, were the they battleships? Yeah. Yeah. Were they going to be an easy target? Uh, battleship row. Mm -hmm. And you, <coughs> the water tower at uh, Pearl Harbor. <coughs> if you come across Tecum Field, you can go uh, fly right at, at that uh, tower. Mm -hmm. You will fly right down Battleship Row, and that's what the Japanese did. So they they, they, they lined up on that tower 
over Hickam and dropped her bomb. They just used it. The this. landscape was clear, so when they came up over the hills, it was just like a beacon. Yeah. They, they didn't have to search or navigate any longer, no. did they? They had a direct shot in. It's like putting a big X on mm -hmm. it. And then it? the harbor itself being clear and so <coughs> narrow, they were sitting ducks. Mm. Tell me about that day. Does it bother you to talk about no. it? No. Okay. Tell me about, about that December day. 7th? Mm -hmm. I was in bed. Oh, was it? It was a Sunday morning and about uh, 10 minutes till 8. Uh, uh, the, the, the clocks on our wall stopped at, uh, what, 7 minutes till 8. So they bombed that place uh, after I left. And uh, they, they were bombing Pearl Harbor. And uh, I went down to the window, I was in the second story, and looked out below, and my friend that I had gone into the service with uh, was down playing catch football out in the per big parade field out, uh, uh, out the edge of the building. And I said, what's going on, Delbert? And he said, I don't know, but are you using live ammunition? And about that time, a Japanese Zeke came by and had a machine gunner standing up in the back shooting right at me, you know. And uh, I had a big orange dot on the air side of the airplane. Said, you know, said it was Japanese. Mm -hmm. And of course I ducked down behind a concrete wall in the bit, it was a concrete bar barrack. Mm -hmm. Six inch walls and the other, outside of that wall, there was these pock marks with b bullet holes. And uh, it's still, they're still there. They never repaired them, they just painted them. So all of the barracks and the bullet holes are there oh for history. Mm -hmm. So I, du I ducked down below the, the bullet mm -hmm. and uh, I went over to the hangar where I was at. The airplane we were at, and uh, who, uh, God was going to get our airplane take it uh, out across the field, if, disperse it, mm -hmm. and uh, but uh, we couldn't uh, get a bomb site to have them locked up in the armament, armament, armament room. Mm -hmm. <laughs> The guard, he didn't want to let us in there, take the bullets. We just shot the lock off the door. Somebody had a gun, shot the lock off, and got a bomb site, put in the airplane, and took it out across the field. In the plane? Yeah. yeah. You yeah. were in the plane? No, attack, uh, pulling it. Oh. Oh, you were just trying to move it. Mm-hmm. And by then uh, some pilots had showed up and they were with us talking about us and I was driving a tug pulling the airplane to take it out across the field. What's a tug? A t uh, tractor. Oh okay, okay. And <clears throat> I stopped down there in front of the tower to look to get a green light to cross the runway <laughs> and the pilot <laughs> They said, what the hell are you stopping for? <laughs> I says, I'm waiting for a green light. And he says, that damn tower has been shot out an hour ago. He says, go on and cross the runway. So I went on across the runway. And I felt guilty about crossing the runway without a green light. <laughs> was there a lot of confusion? Did uh, people know what was happening? Well, we, yeah, we knew what was happening, all right. By then? Yeah. yeah. But... Uh, uh, I didn't see very many, very many people, and we go one out across the runway and parked the B-17, and uh, was loading bombs in it, and they came back for the for the second attack, which was ten o'clock. Started shooting the airplane up, and the bomb shell bouncing off those big old bombs in there. And I said, let's get the hell out of here. <laughs> and uh, we took off. The airplane was 
shot up bad. So you did get it in the air. No, it didn't. no, no. It did was... we get many? Did we get any planes? Oh many yeah, planes got a few. Got a few, two or three in the air. But uh, they went south looking for the Japanese, and they were north. And at the time, too, you weren't sure if you were just having an air invasion or a ground invasion. Do you remember that? Well, uh, you didn't know I didn't how they know. were coming. No. In the meantime, I'd uh, got myself a rifle. What kind of rifle? A rifle. Uh -huh. I guess it was a. Uh, hmm. It was the old army, Springfield, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got two bad dadness. I look, I look like a Mexican uh, bandito. Cross <laughs> my shoulder, and I uh, carried that rifle, and. Uh, <clears throat> found a set of binoculars, and I was going to go to the hills, because there wasn't anybody around, you know. So the troops were <coughs> organized mm -hmm. at that point in time. Where was everyone? I, Lord, I don't know. <coughs> I, I took that airplane that strafed us and hit the bombs. Mm -hmm. I ducked out the side of the airplane and looked up, and he was flying away from me. Mm -hmm. And uh, not, well, as long as he's going that way, I must, I'm safe, you know. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I know, he turned around and he's coming back. Mm -hmm. And uh, he flew right over me. Boy, he had the gun wide open, shooting that beast at the. Uh, B-17 up. Did you know what was happening in the harbor at, during this, or, or were you, I guess you were just caught up with what was happening? <coughs> well, that airplane that, uh, that flew by the barracks, mm -hmm. it was a Zeke, and he, it was a, it's a torpedo bomber. And that he, had a, he was carrying a torpedo that stuck out in front of him and back. It was longer than he was. And, uh, and, and I could hear the explosions over Pearl Harbor. Yeah. When did you get an opportunity to go over to the harbor and see what had happened? I, it was years later. Oh really? Yeah. You weren't you weren't over at the harbor? No. Didn't have any transportation transportation that way. No. Really? And uh, I the the squadron I was with. What was the squadron? A, a squadron is a group of men. Right, but I mean, did it have a number or identification? Yeah. What um, was that? Fourth Recon. Okay. Fourth Recon. <clears throat> did it take long for that squadron to get reorganized oh. after the attack? I don't think it ever did. We went, uh, uh, we left uh, Heckenfield and went to Maui. Uh, now, uh, how soon was that after? Uh, December, uh, December Probably uh, a week, week or so. Oh, really? Yeah. And uh, we were flying uh, sub patrols over there. We, we had, uh, I think, one or two airplanes flying out of our group, which we originally had 10, I think. Mm -hmm. Did you lose a lot of planes at the attack? Yeah, lost them practically uh, all of them. Really? Yeah. 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 On the ground. Mm -hmm. Wheeler Field, which was a fighter base up to 20 miles from us, got some P-40s into the air, and they came down and flew past our, our, our airplanes in line, in line. But by this time, everybody was, had guns and was, I guess, was just in shock because they saw P-40, the easiest airplane to look at that is in the world, looking at it. And they shot at it, 
ever, they flew by and they, everybody on the field shot at that thing. Shot at our own planes? Yeah. Was that just a panic thing? You uh, think? Didn't know what the hell they were shooting at. Mm -hmm. But you're saying it was easily recognized they should yeah. have? <laughs> yeah. Well, you never did tell me, what did you do while you had your Mexican bandito costume on? Where did you go? What did you do that day? Yeah, well, uh, that night, uh, one over the day to a, a, sta a staff sergeant's house. He lived on the base, over, and I went over and stayed, and uh, <clears throat> there was a false alarm because they were Japanese were going to do some night bombing. Okay, I'm sorry. You said the bombs came through the floor. Yeah, it came well, through. I probably didn't get, with the recorder acting up, I didn't get what you were telling about the Anna aircraft and the shrapnel falling. Yeah, yeah. The shrapnel kept falling around like, like, like hail, you know? Mm -hmm. And it, it was wondering, well, we weren't all killed there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I, I can only remember staying there at Hagen one day, you know. Were the barracks not safe? Well, the bombs had, had gone through and hit, had hit the floor and, the, and, and it has, had exploded on the second floor and it had pushed the f wall lockers and beds all down to one end like it, like they had been in a compactor, you know, mm. it just metal, metal on metal. Mm. I uh, finally got back over there and dug, dug, found my locker, and uh, the only thing that I got out of it was uh, my high school sweater. I gave that to my daughter, <laughs> <laughs> and my daughter wears it. Still. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My goodness. Mm -hmm. My goodness. Well, you got orders? So, so I went to Maui mm -hmm. and we flew a, a sub patrol over there. But I wasn't there long, maybe a week or so. Then I uh, went to, went back, came back to the States and went to flying school. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. <laughs> Now this is what you'd wanted. You wanted to be a pilot, right? Mm -hmm. So now you're in flying school. Tell me about that. Well, uh, we went to, came back to the States and went to uh, Santa Ana, California mm -hmm. to uh, primary uh, prep, prep, prep school. Mm -hmm. And then from there I went to Minerfield to primary flying in Ryan's and graduated from there and went up to Bakersfield to fly uh, advanced uh, uh, basic trainers, trainers mm -hmm. and up there they had a, a, a commandant of cadets who didn't like av uh, aviation students and that, that was enlisted people that was becoming pilots. Mm -hmm. And he was really rough on us. And really? Yeah. And told us, he said, we'd get out. And, and so they had a glider program that came, come along. Mm -hmm. And uh, he suggested that we all go to that. And so, I don't know, about 30 or 40 of us in that class just went, went to the glider program. Yeah, where was that held? Where did they hold the, the glider training? In uh, New Mexico. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, uh, what we got down there, the ship down there, the Fort Sumner Air Force Base. And we got off the train there and said that we'd like to get, get a ride out to Fort Sumner, to, to, uh, Fort Sumner Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. And they said, there's no air base here. And one woman says, well, they, get, they were still they were building one out there. Mm -hmm. so, so, so they called a, a, a number and they sent us out there to this military base. 
and uh, we living lived in tents, and uh, we had to make the runways ourselves. We got there and chopped out down the, that old bare grass. It's it's a cactus-like plant that grows like a lily. Mm -hmm. Leaves stick out, uh, and. Uh, So we we chopped down out a lot of week, weeks chopping that bear grass out and making a runway and finally got some airplanes in there and, and uh, they they sent us uh, they started off flying cubs you know, so we're back to flying basic training I guess mm -hmm. and uh, We got graduated from there and went out to Min Minerfield, California, Muir Rock Dry Lake. And uh, we uh, flew gliders. Tell me about the gliders. Well, <clears throat> they didn't have gliders to begin with, they had sailplanes, Schweitzers. And it was a, a sailplane, you could catch a thermal and stay up all day riding that thermal. A thermal? Mm-hmm. A oh. hot air. Oh, okay. And so that was a hard trick, it was to, to catch a thermal and, and, and ride the thermal. Were, was there just one pilot and uh, a glider? Uh, well, uh, one person? I don't, I think, uh, basically, yes. How did you like it? It was fun. It's quiet? Mm, yeah. Lord, if you recall that. Anyway, uh, someplace along the line, we got some CG4A, that's gliders. Oh, okay. Troop gliders that carry a jeep and twenty men or something like that. Oh, that's a big, that's a big glider. Yeah. And uh, and uh, it was pulled by C forty seven. And uh, I graduated from there in glider program, and uh, yeah, went out out last Nebraska joined uh, an outfit. Uh, I don't know, 63rd Troop Carrier Squadron, I think it was. The 60 what? 63rd uh -huh. Troop Carrier Squadron. Okay. And uh, we went, the, the, we sh the ship gave us clothes to, for Arctic survival. Arctic. <laughs> mm -hmm. Heavy. Mm -hmm. Did you know where you were going? Thought we did. <laughs> Someplace in the Arctic. <laughs> so they sh shipped us out. And they put us on a boat and they took us to the South Pacific. And I carried those winter clothes with me for all the way through the, out to, through the Pacific, you know, near. Because, you know, I was in the old school, if you don't waste government property. <laughs> so I, 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 uh, I had that. Arctic clothing with me brought back brought it back to the states. <laughs> and uh, I guess you didn't use it very much. No, I never used it. <laughs> uh, I didn't realize we used gliders in the Pacific. I, I'm familiar with gliders in Europe, but well, they didn't. We were down there. We were on ended up on Guadalcanal. And uh, probably spent two or three months there, and they decided they weren't wasn't going to use gliders out there. Mm -hmm. And so they shipped us back to the states. Yeah, I got back to the states, and uh, I wanted to come go to finish my flying training, mm -hmm. so I, I applied for flying flying school again. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, you can't get back in. You were, you, you washed out, cadet. I said, no, I didn't. 
I volunteered, went into the toilet program. So they looked that up in the record and found out that that's the truth. Mm -hmm. And so I went back to fine school. Mm -hmm. And uh, by this time, well, that, 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 that story out on Guadalcanal or something else. Uh, the story. Yeah. Well, tell me. I've got some pictures. Of it. You want to turn that thing off? Uh -huh. I'll get it. Okay. So you're going to tell me the good story about what was it, Guadalcanal? Yeah. Okay. That uh, that's a picture of myself and <clears throat> and uh, my best friend during the time, George R. Tuck. There's a picture of this native. If you notice, he standing there, doesn't have any shoes on. He does. No, well, he's holding a rifle, but he yeah. has no shoes. Yeah. Well. Now these are natives. And he, 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 he was native. Okay. Chief. And this. Chief of Azusa. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I see the spelling on it. <laughs> the girls that are transcribing are going to ask me how to spell that. Okay. Now, what are these pictures? That's those pictures of uh, of this in an airplane that we that flew down there. It was a lit, litter uh, airplane. A what? A uh, litter. Oh, okay. Car carry people in, mm -hmm. and 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 we flew uh, people from the around Guadalcanal to to a hospital ship. Oh, okay. Anyway. Well, tell me about being at Guadalcanal. Well, we, we were there and uh, we, we never, didn't have any fly and gliders using gliders, mm -hmm. but to keep us busy, they gave us jobs. Mm -hmm. And they made me mess sergeant, oh. a captain, <laughs> or in charge of the mess. I complained about the meal bowl being the same. Mm -hmm. They said, all right, you're, you're the new mess officer. So I, I took over the mess job. And uh, they, 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 to, you get to go to the grocery store, the, the, dump, the, the dump where the food was at, and you, you, they, they gave you a list of what you were supposed to eat. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, you go to the dump and pick up this. The items. To items, mm -hmm. you know. And I, I would go there and uh, when I would say, say, and one case of span and five cases of span the ham. Mm -hmm. I said, one to the people loaded. Mm -hmm. One, not five. They said, uh, and one case, uh, five cases of turkey. Yeah. I say, yeah, I, <laughs> I get, I get double good stuff, you know. You didn't want that spam, huh? No. <laughs> and they still sell that stuff. People still eat that stuff. Well, did the food improve while you were the, in charge of the mess? I, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that the natives there a, after the war uh, didn't have any food. So we, I, I would always get them some, you know. Mm -hmm. Go give it to old Azusa, mm -hmm. and he would, he hated the Japs. In fact, he had a, in his camp, he had a, about 34 heads that he'd cut off, and real heads. Yeah. Japanese heads. Japanese heads. Finally yeah, he was mean. Well, they were mean to his people. About starved his people. Yeah. During their occupation. So. The children here in this picture with, that looks like an army jeep back there, but they're just little boys. Yeah. They look like they're yeah. four and yeah. five, yeah. six years old. Yeah. Were they, how were they exposed to this? Oh. The same as They, they, they had his from the Japanese, I guess. Yeah. 
Anyway, over the years, he hated the Japs, so we fed him. Mm -hmm. And uh, we well, wouldn't want him as an enemy. Oh. <laughs> I would. I would definitely want him as a friend. Oh my goodness! How long were you there? Uh, maybe uh, three or four months. We were there long enough that we did showed him how to plant a garden and sent back to the States as George did and got Victory Gardens. Victory Gardens. And Tell me about Victory Gardens. I've heard that term and no one else has used that term but me, but I've heard that term, Victory Gardens. Well, uh, a Victory Garden is <laughs> you planted garden, uh, vegetables gardens and ate off the gardens uh, because they started during World War One. Yeah, uh, uh, I guess uh, uh, canned fruits and stuff like that was scarce, mm -hmm. and Victor Gardens helped uh, alleviate the shortage. Oh, okay. So, what you sent back to the states for seeds? Yeah, for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, we planted them. Mm -hmm. And yeah. And we planted some watermelons and stuff like that, you know. And it was just coming up, and we had to leave. So you don't know whether they knew how to figure out their right. Uh, <laughs> Did you tell them about something? <laughs> <laughs> They'd probably eat them green. <laughs> oh, my. Well, now, from Guadalcanal, you went back to the States, mm -hmm. and you entered pilot training. Fly, flying school, mm -hmm. yeah. And graduated from fly, uh, twin engine uh, flying school down in Mentorfield, I guess, it was down in Macon, Georgia. Mm -hmm. And uh, by, by then, war was just about over, and they didn't take us into uh, bombers or anything, pursuits or anything like that, mm -hmm. just was around, you know. And I got a job flying for the forestry service. After the war? Mm -hmm. Well, it was uh, just about, it was winding down, mm -hmm. and they didn't know what to do with the pilot, you know. Mm -hmm. And I had this job flying for the forestry service, and <clears throat> And drop smoke to jumpers and things like that. Um, Where were you when the war ended? Well, I was uh, in an airplane uh, uh, between Boise, Idaho, and someplace in Oregon, mm -hmm. and they said it was ended. And I would have done a slow, slow road, but I was in an old biplane, I, think, I mean uh, transport, mm -hmm. it's, uh, I don't know what they can all call it. Anyway, when it you, wasn't an airplane you wanted to do rolling. You, you, did, you couldn't celebrate, huh? Uh, when you entered in 1939, how long did you uh, agree to be in the service? We, we were not at war yet, so mm. did you just enter for a short period uh, of time? Probably uh, uh, over there, what, so two years? Okay. Yeah, two years maybe. And so at some point you re-enlisted, or did they no, not the give you that started. option? No, okay. the war started. Okay, so that option's gone. That option is gone, and by the time that uh, I could have gotten out, I'd have had to, but... Uh, seven or eight years in mm -hmm. and uh, I just decided well I got this in I'll just finish up 20 and I did I stayed 20 years and, uh, well I want to talk to you about that because I understand that's what brought you to Smyrna mm -hmm. but before we do that let me just go back and touch on a, a few things during World War II um, were there times of joy I'm Pardon? sure I'm sure there were times of fear but were there times of joy, times that you just really enjoyed, and did you have entertainment available to you? I talked to someone who saw a Bob Hope show. <laughs> uh, you you talk about, about uh, 
entertainment troops. Mm -hmm. Oh, Roy Acuff came to Alaska. Were you in Alaska? Alaska. Uh huh. And uh, I flew his troops all over Alaska, and uh, I guess I saw about twenty of his shows. <laughs> In fact, uh, they followed a routine. Mm -hmm. Everything, and uh, I, I was sitting there watching the show. I don't know. I, I you know, Cleet maybe, and uh, somebody missed their lines, you know. And I said, <laughs> "Oh, Oswald said, boy, that sure brought him back to life." <laughs> You had the show memorized. You saw yeah. it so many times. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have communication with home? With who? Home. Oh, yeah. Your parents? Mm -hmm. Was it by letters? Mm -hmm. By letters, yeah. Did they know where you were all the time? Uh, yes. Uh -huh. Now, on December 7th, they would have known where you were. Mm -hmm. How soon were you able to get them word that you mm -hmm. were okay? Probably two days. I, I phoned. I said, okay, I'm all right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, tell me how you wound up in, in Smyrna. Hmm. I, I came here from, uh, from Alaska. Mm -hmm. Lad Air Force Base. Lad Air Force Base, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, I came here as a maintenance officer, officer of, of the airplanes. And uh, when you had a choice of attack unit or a sack unit coming out of Alaska, right? I think tactical yeah. or strategic yeah. Yeah. command yeah. post. Mm -hmm. Now, you tell me how many people were in Smyrna when you came. Uh, I came to Smyrna and there was 368 on the road sign, uh, a population 368. When was that? Mm. Oh. 1958. When was it? 19... 50, probably 57, because we were in Murfreesboro, yeah. what, for a year waiting on housing? Yeah, about 1956, maybe. Okay. Because yeah. we've had the same, you've had the same phone number here in Smyrna since 1958. Is that right? The 2847 number, yeah. Tell so, me about Seward Air Force Base, when it was operating as an Air Force Base. <laughs> God. I can't, it's, it was a, just an ordinary military base. I don't know anything to say about it. As kids of Air Force, but we were told local people were supposed to stay away from us heathens. We were foreigners. Well, now, that 368 population, that wouldn't have, would that have included the personnel at the base? It did not include the personnel at the base. And they had about another 1,500 maybe. Mm -hmm. Most of those people were not local, I take it. No, no. No. How busy was the base? Busy. Always busy. Mm -hmm. It was the Tactical Air Command transport outfits and do busy hauling uh, people uh, up at Fort Campbell and Fort Bragg, dropping them, mm -hmm. smoke dumping them, and haul, always hauling freight. Now, your daughter told me to ask you about the C-130s. Good airplane. Well, tell me about it. <laughs> well, uh, we, I went from uh, C-47s to, 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 into 123s, which was uh, another prop-driven aircraft, mm -hmm. and moved up into C-130s, which is, was a turbine engine, and it brought it up into to modern day aviation. Mm -hmm. When did you come into C-130s, Dad? Hmm. About, uh, what, 1959? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Coming into this area then? Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, when I first came here, they they had uh, C-119s. See, okay. But the C-130 has been kind of a staple. 
And I guess. well, uh, everybody knew that uh, it was going to be the next staple aircraft, like mm -hmm. the C-47 mm -hmm. was for years and years and years. And, uh, and everybody knew that uh, C-130 was the next aircraft that would be around forever. And it is, has been. Oh, what is it? What's this, 2,000? 40 years? 40 years, yeah. Yeah, What's, 40 years. It's a, it's a carrier plane? Yeah. What's the capacity? Hmm. What can you put in that thing? Uh, 120 people. Weapons carriers and jeep, two three jeeps. Oh, it's big. It would be. And so you flew those. Mm-hmm. Now, when did you retire? Mm, 1960. Oh. Mm-hmm. April of 60, I think. Now, that's before the base closes, mm -hmm. isn't it? Mm -hmm. The base closed in... 69. 69. Tell me about the base closing and the impact on Smyrna. Uh, <clears throat> when the base closed, it, it Smyrna kind of dried up. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the housing at, uh, at, uh, in Meadowbrook, which was a subdivision, uh, you could have you could have bought the houses just to, just by taking over the payments of, of the military that lived there, mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of people did. You know, mm -hmm. they they had bought ten or twelve houses and kept them, and, and eventually they rendered them out. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Smyrna has certainly rebounded. Yes, Smyrna has. It, it, uh, <clears throat> Smyrna has, has grown you know, mm -hmm. now, slowly. Yeah. Now you chose to stay in Smyrna when you retired from the military. Mm -hmm. What did you do then? When I retired, mm -hmm. uh, I opened the Omni Hut what I had heard. Tell me about that, from flying C-130s to being a restaurant owner. And the Omni Hut is sort of a landmark of its own, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. Well, tell me about that. Why did you choose that? Uh, well, uh, I knew a restaurant man up in Rantoula, Illinois, and he says, and, and he had a steakhouse. And I said, why a steakhouse in this town? He said, well, you can't hide a good restaurant. Yeah, people will come if it's good. And I had thought that about the Omni Hut, you know. When I have a good restaurant, people will come. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I went on those, those thoughts, you know. And I, I went to the local bank and said, I told him about what I want to do. Yeah, he said, fine. What do you want to do? What are you going to do? I said, I want to open a restaurant. No way. He wouldn't loan me any money. And so I went to Murfreesboro to Murfreesboro. It was a uh, what did they call it? It was a, a <coughs> bank. A bank, but I guess they loaned money. But it was mainly a place that handled mortgages in place like what did they call it. Uh, mortgage bank, a trust company. I don't know what they had. It was a Murfreesboro trust, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, they let they loaned me the money to build us, and I, I did. And uh, same thing uh, when I was buying equipment. I was buying equipment. And one restaurant supply man came out and he he wanted to sell me a meat saw, you know, for cutting up country ham. I says, I don't want a meat saw. He says, you don't want a meat saw. I said, no, I don't. 
Alicia, he closed his damn books and left. <laughs> because or, I wasn't sell, sell country in. You don't sell country in, you can't stay in business. Yeah. Whenever Omni Hut, where did the idea come from that you were going to do? Is, is that Polynesian? Is that mm. the term you use for it? No, I'm, Omni Hut, uh, up at the uh, Shinu, we named the club. Mm -hmm. We called it the Fan Marker. After flying terms, fan marker is a signal on a beam that tells you how, how far from uh, you are out on the beam. Mm -hmm. And the Omni HUD is, is the Omni range, which is was the modern way for landing. And for every Omni range, I had a HUD out there someplace that was... So we called it the Omni HUD. You know? So it's actually a flying term. Flying term. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, now what are you going to sell there if you're not going to sell country ham? Going to sell Polynesian food. Okay. Now where does that come from? Where's your experience with Polynesian food? Uh, is it from that? Is it from managing that mess in uh, no, Guadalcanal? Uh, <laughs> while I was in the service, mm -hmm. we used to get off duty at uh, at noon, go early and stay until noon and then you had the rest of the day off and I was uh, I got a job over if you can get it okay so so you're working at a restaurant while you're at, at Hickam Field yeah uh, uh, lousy jobs there, it was a, a business that catered to tourists that, that, uh, that would Book them in there. They just still do the same thing in Hawaii, you know. Mm -hmm. they, 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 they have barbecue places mm -hmm. and they have luau's, and you go out and enjoy an evening with a luau. With, cause they cook a pig in the ground. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you work the, as a cook there? I, I, no, I a vegetable cleaner. Okay. <laughs> but uh, it was there that I I, I I learned a lot about cooking. Uh, what I did, we, but when I got the job, there was a, a boy named Charlie Chan, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, he surfed board out at Waikiki Beach, and I sort of surfed out there and uh, met him. And he asked me, if I wanted a job working in the restaurant, you know, mm -hmm. he we were he worked there, and uh, I said yeah. So I went on, and, and I, I, I've I noticed this had that you could get in one place and go someplace else and order the same thing as different, mm -hmm. and that kind of got me interested in it, you know. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I spent, uh, uh, out of my 20 years, I spent seven years in South Pacific and uh, on Guam. I learned a lot from uh, a Russian there. Well, you didn't tell me about being on Guam. <laughs> that you're, was a, You're keeping secrets from me. <laughs> no, well, after the war, mm -hmm. I was sent back to Guam. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So tell me about that experience. Well, <laughs> apparently it had a big impact on your career later on if, if, if that experience came back to be a part of your business. Well, uh, yeah, well, Charlie Corn was a, a bus boy, a house boy for General MacArthur in the Philippines, and he got permission to open Chinese restaurants on all the military bases in the South Pacific. And uh, Charlie Corn, they cooked differently than most people did. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just picked up what he uh, learned what, uh, what uh, 
later turned out to be uh, hmm, what's the salt based soy sauce no powder that you MSG MSG mm -hmm. they call it Chinese seasoning powder you know mm -hmm. uh, what well, put MSG. that in in everything then that was good, you know. Mm -hmm. it, what it, did, it enhances the taste mm -hmm. of vegetables. Mm -hmm. So uh, they put this Chinese seasoning powder in it, you know. Mm -hmm. And I found, well, but back in the States, uh, I, I asked for Chinese seasoning powder, and they didn't know what the hell I was talking about. <laughs> it was MSG. Mm -hmm. How long were you on Guam? Hmm. Three years. Mm -hmm. And what did you do there? Uh, aircraft mechanic. Oh, okay. uh, 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 fixed airplanes. Mm -hmm. And uh, during its time, uh, they destroyed all of the B 29s. Who destroyed the B 29s? We did. Oh. Right, you know, didn't, rather than fix them up and set them around someplace, it was easier to get rid of and, and take the parts that were valuable. Mm -hmm. Blow them up, bury them, run them off. So uh, we blew them up, took took all the uh, va valuables off from them. And, and that happened at Guam? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I was in charge of blowing them up and, take, and salvaging them, uh -huh. salvaging them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, <clears throat> you remember that uh, photo that, that uh, we destroyed that one airplane and had uh, had me in the airplane? Um, that old film? Yeah. I don't know what happened there. Well, uh, you had that tin of, uh, had a whole thing of films. I don't yeah. know. Anyway, had, oh. uh, anyway, we had this... Uh, <laughs> weren't supposed to be one, making one the film, film, but they did. Yeah. And, uh, now this is film yeah. that would have been on the plane. Yeah, thing. and I'm uh, standing in the door of the Contraband. plane out there and jumped after we'd salvaged and <laughs> got all the parts out. Uh -huh. uh, I waved uh, like this at everybody. And, and then uh, we went back in and loaded it down with Comp C, that's in a plastic explosive and everything, and uh, set it off, boom, right after, after I left the car, and it looked like it exploded while I was in there waving. Oh, <laughs> you were just having fun. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, mm. and, uh, that, that film, I think, was, was in that film that uh, the place down there in Murfreesboro lost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We took it in to have it re-reported. -re From 35 millimeter yeah. to cassettes, and yeah. they lost a lot of the film. Mm -hmm. They lost it all. My goodness, my goodness. So, you're sitting in Smyrna, and you decide you're going to cook Polynesian food. Oh, I had decided that, 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 that sometime, two years before, I guess, mm -hmm. sometime before, Mm -hmm. that uh, I was going to do that when I retired. Mm -hmm. So it's a family-owned business. Mm -hmm. Do you still operate the Omni Hut? My daughter does. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So how did Smyrna take to Polynesian food in the, in the beginning? What? Yeah, you couldn't feed everybody. <laughs> but not, not uh, people in Smyrna didn't come. People from Nashville and Goodlesville and Shelbyville and McMinnville, every place came here. They still do. Mm -hmm. It's not Smyrna Trade that keeps us afloat. Really? It helps, but the bulk of it comes from outside of Smyrna. Do that do they still? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like the Tiki Bar Review. We mm -hmm. didn't. Tiki Bar Review said one of the worst things about us is our location. <laughs> Yeah. We're not near anything. We're just stuck out here. Oh, Mr. Wallace, man. what do you think the impact oh. of the war was on you personally? 
Hmm. You can't go through that <laughs> and and not come not have a lot of changes in your life and how do you think it impacted you personally? Well, I, I, it's a hard question to answer. Yes, it is. Uh, I guess I don't know. Don't know the answer to that. Do you have any idea? Well, you're a determined old guy. You hmm? know, you have a determination that most people don't have. I don't know. Well, that, what? I do. Well, I think you do. You know. I'm um, sure we were talking earlier about the recent terrorist attacks in New York City. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that brought many memories back yeah, to you. Yeah, it sure did. What are your thoughts on that? On that, 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 that well, I, I was uh, like everybody else, wanted revenge, you know, right away. Mm -hmm. And um, I still I think in, that, that uh, we might soften our stance. And back down, mm -hmm. which would be a grave mistake. Go after them, stay after them. Ruthlessly. Damn the torpedo, full speed ahead. <laughs> Ruthlessly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Military life was a good experience for you. Well, I, I it, it, it dominated my life. Yeah, mm -hmm. I didn't say it was good. Because I have a, a sister that's a nurse and a brother that's a doctor. And now, were they in the service? Yeah. What was your sister's experience like? Well, she, she, she was a, a nurse in the South Pacific. Where she moved right with them. You know, she was she had worked in a mm -hmm. hospital as a came out of the battlefield. She's tough. And Trulis is what? How old's Trulis now? 89? Oh, she, she, yeah, she must be 90. 90. The yeah. sister? Mm -hmm. What's her name? Trulis. T-R-U-L-I-S. L-I-S. L-L-I-S. Trulis. All his siblings are still living. Mm -hmm. so. Was your brother a doctor mm -hmm. during the war? No. After. He was a he went to flying school and was a B twenty nine pilot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was he in the in the Pacific or was he in No, he he never got out of the States. You know, the war ended oh. while while he had taken flight mm -hmm. uh, uh, he wanted fighters and he got B twenty nine. That's a bomber, is mm -hmm. that right? Mm. Yeah. Well, I appreciate so very much you sharing these memories. I just did a rough outline. Is there anything else you'd like to record on this? Because this is going to be kept in the archives. So if there's anything you'd like to add to this story. A story that will live in infamy, Father. Yeah. You'll be, you'll be up there with the... The gore papers at MTSU. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to put you on our website. Oh, oh, right. Right. Oh. Uh. I love MTSU. <laughs> I do. Oh, we're lucky uh. we've got it in our backyard. But are there stories that I haven't asked you for that you'd like to share? No. 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 Well, we and we're here. The military yeah. base is how we wound up here, and we've been here ever since. And I guess that's where, and all of the kids are here. So this is home now. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate you sharing it. Uh, I'm sure it was a. I can't imagine. I went and saw the movie Pearl Harbor, so that's my, my best thing to compare it to. Did you see the movie? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did it seem authentic? At all? Well, it uh, mostly focused on the ship. A naval it was all, mostly uh, on Pearl Harbor, and it showed a lot of people swimming and around in uh, oil-covered water, water, mm -hmm. 
And uh, I didn't see any of that. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the people, uh, that, I don't know, the 200 or so that was killed at Hickam Field, I didn't, uh, I saw two people get killed. Mm -hmm. One boy got burnt to death. He, you know, he was up in the front of a B-18 shooting at but the Japanese that came by, and and the Japanese were shooting back back at him, and it, it lit off the magnesium flares between his escape and then where he was at, mm -hmm. and, and burn up, and he burn up with. It. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine. It yeah. must have been several days before you could get a good night's sleep. Did you think they would be back? I thought they would, yeah, be back, yeah. That's why I was turned into a Mexican bandito and I was going to the hills. How long did all of that last that day? You said it was a little before seven? There was two, two hours. Mm -hmm. to, uh, one uh, tack. Well, the clock on the, my wall was stopped at uh, 10 minutes after 8. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it, was, it was somewhere before that that uh, they actually started. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the second wave was, came about 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Well, you're fortunate to be yeah. here to tell that story. Yeah. And I appreciate you sharing it with us. Thank you so much.